so hello and welcome to this MPTL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies, uh, where we'll begin with a new text today. Uh, so we just finished looking at a series of texts, uh, and most recently we finished looking at Jan Hacking's um, The Social Construction of What, where we saw uh, the dangers of over the dangers of oversimplification that might come with a social constructionist theory, if you just rely on that as the key. Uh, investigative mechanism. So this particular text, the one which we'll begin with today, is entitled Understanding Patriarchy by Bell Hooks. Um, this should be on the screen, but before we dive into the text, I just want to spend some time uh, talking about the text in general, talking about Bell Hooks in general, and talking about the significance of this particular text in the context of our course, Introduction to Cultural Studies. Uh, one of the really sophisticated and complex things which this particular text does, and it's an essay as you can see, is that it really looks at the combination between um, experientiality and discursivity. So again, um, this is something that uh, Hacking had talked extensively about, um, that if you're looking at everything as a constructed discourse, uh, that often takes the attention away from the experientiality uh, of the phenomenon, uh, from the experientiality of the event, right? So the experientiality of the event should be considered uh, as one of the key things, as one of the key components of any particular event, of any particular phenomenon, uh, rather than looking at it from a purely uh, constructionist perspective where uh, it, the argument is everything is a social construct, everything is constructed as a text, etc. So Hacking had talked about a balance between discursivity and um, experientiality. So the, the phenomenality of an experience, uh, the experientiality of an event, so these things become very important uh, in Hacking's analysis as we saw in the last text that we covered, the social construction of what. And Hacking had mentioned Judith Butler uh, and a series of other writers and thinkers who he thinks uh, move away from this purely constructionist perspective and offer a more complex, uh, a, more, a more rich perspective on events, texts um, and phenomena. Now, in many sense, this particular text, you know, Understanding Patriarchy, uh, has a lot of similarity in terms of structure, in terms of sentiment, in terms of style with Franz Fano's black skin, white marks. Again, I mean, we saw when we read that particular text, if you remember, you know, Fano talks about the real rage, the real resentment, the very visceral feeling of being uh, marginalized, which comes out uh, uh, throughout this text. And it's not just limited uh, to a discursive understanding of uh, you know, the entire phenomenon as a construct, as a text, etc. But it becomes more than that. It becomes an experiential understanding. It becomes a visceral understanding. So the um, experientiality, the viscerality, the embodied quality of the entire phenomena, about the entire experience becomes uh, and the key thing for Fano uh, in black skin, white marks, and as a result of which we find that particular book really compelling in terms of looking at the fact of blackness, in terms of looking at the experience of blackness, not just as a construct, but also as a real lived bodily experience that is suffered, that is, um, you know, gone through viscerally and at a very embodied level. Now, in many sense, understanding patriarchy uh, is a similar kind of a text. It talks about the real experience of uh, suffering patriarchy. And one of the really sophisticated things which this particular text does, it, it moves away from this very blunt binary between men and women. So it moves away from the binary which says that men are evil and men are the perpetrators of patriarchy and women are the, just the innocent victims, sufferers of patriarchy. It moves away from that particular binary and offers a more complex understanding of patriarchy, whereby we see how uh, men and women uh, can be both complicit and collusive uh, with patriarchy and can suffer patriarchy at the same time. So he, she talks about quite interestingly how uh, men can obviously perpetrate patriarchy and that's a more dominant understanding of patriarchy as being controlled and coerced and perpetrated by men but at the same time men can also suffer patriarchy uh, and conversely women suffer patriarchy more often than not they are the victims of patriarchy they are on the receiving end of the horrors of patriarchy but at the same time there are also instances many instances several instances and as Hooks points out where women become the you know the the complicit partners of patriarchy, uh, the collusive partners of patriarchy, and they enact patriarchy in a way which is sometimes worse than male-controlled patriarchy. So patriarchy over here is a phenomenon. Patriarchy over here is a discourse as well as an experience. Uh, it's a set of rules uh, which have uh, sometimes a textual quality to it, but also an experiential quality to it. So there are rules which need to be followed, which need to be conformed to uh, at a very embodied level, at a very um, daily level. Okay, so patriarchy becomes a very interesting phenomenon, and this particular text has an excellent understanding of patriarchy as a 
discursive as well as a uh, experiential phenomenon, right? So understanding patriarchy becomes a key text as we'll see when we move on uh, to our reading of the text in terms of looking at how cultures are constructed, how cultures are experienced, how cultures are you know, suffered, uh, you know, obviously patriarchal cultures are mentioning over here, uh, through real experiences of suffering, through real experiences of resentment, through real experiences of, you know, victimization and also obviously uh, it includes violence, it includes domination, it includes control uh, at a very coercive level and these become very important uh, components of patriarchy in more sense than one. So uh, this particular and uh, like Fano, again uh, like Fano, uh, bell hooks often relies on draws on anecdotal analysis. So we saw in Fano how he often draws on anecdotes about real incidents which really happened to him uh, as a person, as a black person, as a black intellectual in France and Algeria and in many other places around. And he often draws on those experiences in terms of analyzing or examining uh, the event, the, the fact of blackness and you know, the anecdotal analysis often uh, lends a very rich personal and direct quality uh, in Fano's writing. So likewise, when you see bell hooks, we find that you know, even you know, this particular book relies and draws on anecdotal evidence on several occasions. It talks about real life experiences, it talks about what really happened uh, to the writer, how she suffered, how she experienced certain uh, phenomena, certain events, and how those experiences go on in terms of you know, offering a really rich and complex uh, and sometimes uncertain understanding of patriarchy as a real phenomenon, not just as a discursive text, not just as a textual strategy, not just as a discursive strategy, but also as a real uh, embodied corporeal visceral phenomenon. And that's one of the key things that we'll keep highlighting as we read this particular text. So in a nutshell, this particular text looks at patriarchy as a grand narrative and you know, if you look at grand narratives, if you look at almost any grand narrative, whether it's religion or you know nation or language or uh, any of those um, you know related uh, phenomena, we find it's hard to find a grand narrative which is not patriarchal in quality. So patriarchy seems to be embedded in almost all grand narratives, right? So we can't think of a grand narrative which is not patriarchal in in, in some sense or the other. So patriarchy becomes uh, the default grand narrative in some sense. The covert grand narrative inside other grand narratives and obviously it's a grand narrative in its own right. Uh, it's perhaps the most successful, the most sinister and the most uh, you know daily grand narrative, you know, the grand narrative which is most daily consumed at a most direct level, at a most embodied level, uh, you know, at a most subconscious level. So patriarchy is that most sinister, subconscious and uh, successful, you know, sinisterly successful grand narrative which we can think of. So in that sense, understanding patriarchy becomes a really key text in terms of how this grand narrative is formed, how it is lived, how it is conformed to in daily discourses of life. So in that sense, this particular essay it becomes a very key essay, not just for feminism, not just for gender studies, but also for any discourse analysis. Uh, you know, we saw how Foucault's what is an author was an excellent discourse analysis because it moves away from just looking at the author and looking at a more complex mechanism of how a discourse is formed. You know, in that sense, it becomes a really meta text on discourse analysis. So, in a very similar way, understanding patriarchy too uh, might be read as a discourse analysis, but it's more than that because it, it talks about, like I said, it talks about real lived bodily experiences at a visceral embodied level and, and in that sense it becomes a very key text uh, for an experiential understanding of patriarchy. Okay, so with that preamble, let's dive into the text and see how Hooks uh, talks about patriarchy from an anecdotal perspective as well as from a more intellectual perspective and how uh, she combines the two perspectives and reveals to us that these are not mutually contradictory but these inform each other. So the anecdotal evidence and the intellectual examination, they inform each other much like they do in Fano, um, the particular book that we read, Black Skin, White Marks. Okay, so this is uh, Bell Hooks Understanding Patriarchy which should be on your screen at the moment. Patriarchy is the single most life-threatening social disease assaulting the male body and spirit in our nation. So, the very opening sentence is provocative. You know, again, uh, this provocative quality is something which this particular essay has in you know, uh, commonality with Fano's black skin word marks. I mean, that too, as you saw, was a very provocative text. It really um, uh, it's, it's, it's a very angry text, it's a very angry writing. And it's a rhetoric of rage, it's not just a rhetoric, it's a real experience of rage and resentment that is born out of discrimination, that is born out of suffering and pain and humiliation. So, you know, likewise, this particular text too, uh, it, it carries that 
those sentiments, sentiments of resentment, uh, rage, etc. And if you look at the opening sentence, interestingly, we find that in a bell hooks talks about patriarchy as a as a disease, a social disease. There's almost a medical quality, a medical ring that she has given to patriarchy. It's almost like a pathology, right? So this pathological quality of patriarchy is something that she is highlighting at the very outset of this of this work. Yet men, most men do not use the word patriarchy in everyday life. Most men never think about patriarchy and what it means, how it is created and sustained. And this is true in many ways for any grand narrative, for any uh, complete grand narrative, because you don't realize that it's a construct, you don't realize that it's something which has been formulated. You just live it, you just follow it without, you just obey it, just conform to it. Uh, without really thinking about it. So there's a subconscious quality about a subscription. Uh, it's a subconscious subscription and that's what makes uh, the grand narrative successful in the first place. That is subscribed to it uh, subconsciously, you conform to it without questioning. So most men do not use the term patriarchy, most men are not even aware of the fact that they are patriarchal uh, while actually being so. Uh, so they never think about how it is created and sustained. Many men in our nation would not be able to spell the word or pronounce it correctly. The word patriarchy just is not a part of the normal everyday thought or speech. Men who have heard and know the word usually associate it with women's liberation, with feminism, and therefore dismiss it as irrelevant to their own experiences. So again, she's looking at the way how the word patriarchy is used in everyday parlance and how uh, people associate with it, how there's a degree of resentment because it is looked at as some kind of a flippant feminism thing. Um, you know, it's not for men. Uh, men should not be interested in patriarchy. It's something that feminists use uh, as a strategy to bash men. So that's the kind of very blunt and uh, vulgar understanding of patriarchy that Hooks is highlighting over here. And she says that's one of the reasons why uh, most men choose not to even think about it while actually being supremely patriarchal in their everyday behavior and quality and thought. Men who have heard and know the word usually associate with women's liberation, with feminism, and therefore dismiss it as irrelevant to their own experiences. So again, this uh, lack of relevance that feminism appears to have with men's experiences is something that Hooks is critical of. So she is critical of that kind of feminism, which um, you know disregards men and men's experiences. Um, that kind of feminism which is restricted only to women. And she says that is a feminism which is which actually does a lot of disservice. Uh, to a real and more complex understanding of gender roles and gender behavior. Uh, you know, in a sense, this particular text is also a critique not just of patriarchy but also of feminism, of that kind of feminism which is exclusive in quality, which is exclusionary in quality and not inclusive, not doesn't take into account, uh, doesn't incorporate uh, into its analysis men's experiences and men's suffering and you know, the entire idea of women being complicit to patriarchy. And that's something that she is constantly highlighting uh, throughout this particular text. Okay, I have been standing at podiums talking about patriarchy for more than 30 years. Uh, it's a word I use daily and men who hear me use it often ask me what I mean by it. Okay, so again, look at the personal quality from this particular essay has. So, you know, she's obviously offering a very, very uh, sophisticated and complex and robust analysis of patriarchy, but she's using a language which is intensely indirect, direct, sorry, direct and personal and almost anecdotal in quality and it sort of addresses the reader directly and it gives a sense of immediacy uh, to this particular text and this immediacy, this immediate direct quality is what makes this text so uh, engaging for us readers. It doesn't rely on rhetoric, it doesn't rely on any um, empty intellectual jar jargon but it rather uh, it wants to address the reader directly with an almost informal uh, kind of an equation. So she says quite clearly that you know she's been talking about patriarchy for the last three decades uh, across different uh, situations and different um, different seminars and conferences, and she often gets asked, "What does she mean by patriarchy? What is the meaning? What's the significance? What's her working definition of patriarchy?" And this particular text, uh, this particular essay, you know, is an attempt to address the question in some sense. Nothing discounts the old anti-feminist. Uh, projection of men as all-powerful, more than their basic ignorance of a major facet of the political system that shapes and informs male identity and sense of self from birth until death. So this idea of uh, this, this information, this discourse, this experience, this lesson, this education which shapes and informs male identity from the moment of birth 
to the moment of death is something that you know hooks would define as patriarchy but it's something that most men never even realize and not even you know cognizant of in the daily lives i often use the phrase imperialist white supremacist uh, you know, capitalist patriarchy to describe the interlocking political systems that are the foundation of a nation's politics. So if you look at the adjectives, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, so there are different kinds of, uh, you know, adjectives coming in together. It's racist, it's imperialist, it's capitalist, it's supremacist, it's majoritarian, um, it's expansionist, and that obviously comes under the rubric of patriarchy, and that makes it even more, um, unsettling and violent and this is more uh, I think like all great texts this particular text too is quite prophetic because that is perhaps more true in the times that we live in today and the um, USA that we experience we see today and um, in our daily lives in the news and the media than what it was when uh, Bill Hooks was actually writing so it's actually become more true uh, you know the, the current situation the present is actually more true to this particular description than what it may have been when Hooks originally wrote this particular essay so imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy. So look at the conjoining of different kinds of adjectives coming together to describe the, uh, the interlocking political systems that are the foundation of our nation's politics. Of these systems, the one that we learn, all learn the most about growing up is a system of patriarchy, even if we never know the word, because patriarchal gender roles are assigned to us as children, and we are given continual guidance about the ways we can best fulfill these roles. So. This is something which is a form of indoctrination. It happens from a very early age. Uh, children are taught patriarchy. Children are sort of indoctrinated into patriarchy and they consume patriarchy. They conform to patriarchy and they follow. They enact uh, patriarchal principles sometimes without even being aware of it because it's something which is naturalized and ritualized to different kinds of practices inside the domestic space. So patriarchy informs uh, dominant gender roles in um, daily discourses of life, patriarchy informs uh, the more uh, hegemonic, the more current, the more prevalent uh, you know, gender performance that happens uh, inside domestic situations. So patriarchy in that sense becomes again a very sinister subconscious subscription uh, to a particular kind of ideology, to a particular kind of grand narrative, which obviously doesn't appear to be a grand narrative in the first place. It appears to be a given, it appears to be perfectly naturalized and normalized so it is normativized as well as naturalized and that's the whole that's that's the best way in which uh, any particular discourse can become a grand narrative and patriarchy is no exception to that so patriarchy is a political social system that insists that men males are inherently dominating superior to everything and everyone deemed weak especially females and endowed with the right to dominate and rule over the weak and to maintain that dominance through various forms of psychological terrorism and violence. So in a way, it's a complete legitimization of male violence. It's a complete legitimization of male domination uh, over women or other weaker sections of society, including children sometimes, uh, animals sometimes. So patriarchy becomes this very male-centric kind of dominance and it upholds the notion that men are inherently superior, men are inherently stronger, men are inherently more rational, more intellectual, more intelligent, and hence they're more qualified to, to, to rule, they're more qualified to reign, they're more qualified to dominate, and they become the natural, uh, it's a very selectionist kind of a system, a very selectionist kind of a structure. It's the survival of the fittest, the men are the fittest by default, uh, according to this particular principle, and hence they are most qualified and most eligible uh, to carry out these functions, which sometimes include, often include, uh, violence and domination and terrorism. So this particular uh, phrase over here is very interesting, psychological terrorism and violence. So it's not just terrorism, it's not just violence at a visceral level, but also at a very subterranean psychological level where women and children are taught to obey the fathers and the grand patriarch of the family because that's what is you know, virtuous to do. So patriarchy often uh, in masquerades as a virtue, patriarchy often disguises, often passes off as a virtue, as something which is a good thing to abide by, a good norm to abide by. And like all such strategies, it normalizes, it normativizes itself through naturalization. So it naturalizes itself as a given discourse, as a given uh, situation that we don't even question, we don't even need to question because it is just laid out before, us, uh, before we are born. Uh, so that becomes by default, uh, a default grand narrative that people abide by, people conform to.
Okay, when my older brother, and this is the anecdotal evidence that Hooks keeps supplying throughout this particular essay, in terms of in order to corroborate her arguments, in order to corroborate her uh, contention. When my elder brother, older brother, and I were born with a year separating us in age, uh, patriarchy determined how we would each be regarded by our parents. Both our parents believed in patriarchy. They had been taught patriarchal thinking through religion. So again, look at the constant collusion the patriarchy has with other grand relatives, religion, nationalism, nation, uh, language, culture, so all kinds of grand relatives that you can think of, sexuality, heteronormativity. So they're all patriarchal in, in principle, capitalism, imperialism, so all the grand relatives which are obviously quite sinister, obviously violent and uh, you know, hegemonizing uh, and territorializing. So all these grand relatives with all the territorial quality, territorializing quality, uh, with all their violent quality, with all their megalomaniacal quality, they are inherently patriarchal in their, in their, in their, in their ontology. So patriarchy becomes by the de facto, the by default mechanism for any grand relative. And religion, obviously, is one of the supreme grand relatives, which is completely patriarchal in quality. It's it's a rule, it's a book of rules, more often than not, which are written by men, uh, which are followed by men, and even obviously the more powerful men, they wield. Uh, most power inside religion, they wield the most privilege uh, and the most agency inside religion. And obviously, every almost every religion you can think of, all the major religions that we can think of, the Zodai Christian religions, the Hindu religions, the different kinds of religions that we're aware of, most of them that we are aware of, they have the founding fathers, obviously men, and the founding fathers or the prophets or the messiahs or you know anyone really, more often than not males. And they are the ones who set out the rules, they are the ones who set out the testaments, they are the ones who set out the principles, which are then followed by uh, the other sections of society, including women. So religion and patriarchy go hand in hand. They are completely collusive with each other, they are completely complicit with each other in their structural as well as sentimental qualities. Okay, so uh, Bell Hooks over here, uh, she talks about how um, you know, her particular family, uh, her particular parents, they were patriarchal in the quality and they learned patriarchy through religion as a result of which at the moment that when she was born and her brother was born, her brother was just a year older than her, they were given very different treatments, they were given very different kinds of upbringings based on those patriarchal principles which um, their parents inherited and which their parents consolidated through their engagement with religion. So how was engagement? So in what sense was religion patriarchal and quality? How did religion become complicit? How did religion consolidate uh, the construct of patriarchy and made it into a given which could not be questioned? This is how. At church, they had learned that God created man to rule the world and everything in it, and that it was the work of woman to help men perform these tasks, to obey and to always assume a subordinate role in relation to a powerful man. So you know, this is the genesis story for almost any religion where you know god creates creates man man becomes the first choice and then man is the one who carries out all kinds of functions man is the one who carries out all kinds of significant functions but you know it's a function of the woman uh, to support the man to be the passive supporter to you know stay behind the man uh, and you know support him comfort him and give him all kinds of solace etc uh, but the point is the real responsibilities, the real functions are to be carried out by men and this is the doctrine, this is the uh, principle which is followed by almost every religion and this is something which uh, Bell Hook says that their parents also learned from the church. So they, was, they were taught that uh, God was male, so God was always a male, the prophets of God were so always males uh, and the woman occupied, the woman inhabited a very marginalized, peripheral uh, you know, position in the entire landscape and the entire uh, genealogy, the entire structure of religion, uh, especially uh, the Zodai Christian religion that has been mentioned and alluded to over here. These teachings were reinforced in courthouses, sorry, in every institution they encountered, schools, courthouses, clubs, sports arenas, as well as the churches. So, you know, look at all these institutions and this is uh, in keeping with what we had studied, what we did study at the very beginning of this course, if you remember, all through this understanding of uh, ISA and RSA, uh, ideological state of parameters and repressive state of parameters. So, you know, all the institutions mentioned over here, schools, courthouses, clubs, sports arenas, uh, churches, so each of these institutions belongs to either of these two categories, ISA or RSA. And obviously, these become very instrumental sites, very instrumental spaces where 
patriarchy, the principles of patriarchy are uh, promoted, uh, perpetrated and produced in some sense and then obviously uh, consolidated through different kinds of rituals, different kinds of enactments, uh, very coded enactments which uh, you know, conform and consolidate uh, the patriarchal principles. So embracing patriarchal thinking like everyone else around them, they taught it to the children because it seemed like a natural way to organize life. So again, the naturalness of it is something that is uh, interesting and that is something that we should keep coming back to. The increase in naturalization of patriarchy, how patriarchy is naturalized and like, again like all grand narratives, like any grand narrative, it has to be naturalized. You can't it can't be revealed. So the key thing here is naturalization. So how the entire discourse of patriarchy is naturalized to religion and how Hooks mentions quite clearly over here how parents subscribe to that kind of a discourse. Uh, they consumed it without questioning it and in the process naturalized it. And this naturalization, this naturalized indoctrination is something which is passed off uh, to the subsequent generation, uh, Hooks being uh, a part of the generation and hence this very clear demarcation between the female child and the male child keeps coming up. Uh, throughout this discourse. So, embracing patriarchal thinking, uh, you know, this is an indoctrination and that kind of indoctrination informed the way they treated the children, they, uh, you know, brought up the children uh, and how the difference shared between the male child and the female child and how the female child was taught uh, certain doctrines just because she happens to be a woman, uh, certain doctrines which needs to be followed, needs to be conformed to. And this is embracing patriarchy, this is embracing the patriarchal principles that Hooks mentions. Uh, and this embracing is obviously a form of naturalizing. So we'll conclude the first lecture with this and we'll move on with this text in a subsequent lecture. Thank you for your attention.